I'm uh, president of Canopy Group. Uh, we're a uh, Silicon Valley-based consulting company. Uh, I've been doing that now for about four years. And prior to that, I used to be the senior vice president of global business development and innovation at SRI, uh, at, at the Stanford Research Institute, uh, just up the road here. Um, and uh, over the years, I've done a lot of work in, um, uh, in many, many countries. Uh, you know, so what I hope to do today is to share some of my perspectives around you know, what I think is going on, and, uh, you know, again, it will really be a personal perspective. I, I also just wanted to say that um, I lived in Japan for about four years, but I also spent, and spent a lot of time in Japan over that time, but I've also spent quite a bit of time in Sweden as well. So it's great to have uh, uh, actually a group together from both Sweden and from Japan in one place. And I was telling some of the other, for our Swedish guests here, I was saying that um, I'm probably one of the few Americans that actually has eaten Sturstrommen. So, uh, so I'm probably, probably more Swedish than maybe some of you guys. So anyway, but very nice to meet everyone and I look forward to, uh, to sharing my thoughts tonight. So before we start, uh, I ask Dan to present you know, what's going on in Asia Pacific region uh, for 20 minutes. So uh, if you can go over 20 minutes, then maybe you can <laughs> summarize you know, for everyone what's going on. Yeah. Well, it's a, a huge topic. So, uh, I'm going to hit a few, what I consider to be four dimensions of the strategic situation in the Asia Pacific region. One is the war in Ukraine and how it impacts the region. Uh, second is the sort of trends that I see in, in US China relations. Uh, third is US alliance relationships in the region. 
Uh, and lastly, I want to talk and just raise this really as something I hope you guys can talk to me about as well, which is technology competition and the whether or not uh, there is the room to create a kind of united front uh, on protecting <coughs> technology, which I think is one of the most interesting topics in the region. So being an academic, uh, as well as a journalist, let me start with Ukraine, but I want to give you a little history lesson. So I don't think any of you are old enough to remember the Korean War. I was born just in the, at the beginning of the Korean War myself. Um, but the Korean War offers very important, in my mind, historical parallels and lessons for what we're seeing today. So in brief, uh, you know, if we look at the world in 1948-49, at the beginning of the Cold War, uh, Europe was in crisis. It was economically shattered after the war. The European governments in the West all faced severe internal political challenges from communist <coughs> movements. Uh, the United States was grappling with how to demobilize after the war, uh, to shift resources back home to focus on uh, the home front, if you will. Uh, the, the, we weren't ready for a global confrontation, uh, even though we had drawn some lines with the Soviet Union. And uh, at that moment, uh, Kim Il-sung, who was the Soviet installed leader of North Korea, went to Stalin and sought backing for a military campaign to reunify Korea, which had been divided at the end of the war into a Soviet and American zone of occupation, and then divided into two separate states. And Stalin uh, hesitated to some degree, because his focus was also on Europe. Uh, but Kim Il-sung, uh, to some degree, persuaded him that the South Koreans were going to fold quickly. Uh, in the face of the North Korean army, which was much stronger, and that the Americans were not going to intervene. And Stalin uh, fought that argument to a large extent, in part because American policymakers, like uh, the Secretary of State Atchison, sent signals that said, we are going to draw a defense line as an offshore balancing power. So our defense line runs from Alaska through Japan down to the Philippines. It didn't include Korea, and it didn't include Taiwan, where the Kuomintang, the defeated Chinese nationalists, had retreated at the end of the Chinese uh, Civil War. And Stalin and Mao uh, understood that as a signal that the US would not intervene. And they saw the US being weak, divided, and more preoccupied by what was going on in Europe. Uh, and, but Stalin did insist that Mao if things went wrong, the Chinese would step in and defend the North Koreans. The Soviets were going to commit their own forces. So it was a huge strategic uh, decision on the part of Stalin and Mao, but it was a profound strategic miscalculation. What was the result of it? In fact, the United States intervened immediately. Day one, Truman made the decision to intervene. He saw the North Korean invasion of South as being not a local event, but part of a global challenge posed by the Soviet Union and by the communist world. And as a result of that, we ended up with the Korean War, a fierce struggle. What was the result of that for Stalin and for Mao? For Stalin, he in fact energized the West, energized NATO, energized Europe, in fact created the alliance systems that were built in Asia, which still exist and which are still the foundation of American foreign policy. Our security alliances with Japan, with Korea, South Korea, and to some degree with Taiwan are all a result of the, this miscalculation on the part of Stalin. Mao lost something even bigger in some ways. He lost Taiwan because the United States wasn't going to defend Taiwan. Uh, we, had, we had basically written it off. They, two days after the North Korean invasion, the Seventh Fleet was sent into the Straits, the Taiwan Straits, between Taiwan and the mainland. And the US made a decision now, then, to defend Taiwan. Mao, who had been planning marshalling forces to cross the Straits and take control of Taiwan, had to back off. And here we are today, 
the, the separation of Taiwan and China is in some sense an outcome of this strategic miscalculation, huge one. And rather than being preoccupied with Europe, which the US was, the US then was actually forced to broaden its global commitments and in some ways shift the entire course of the Cold War. So I believe that like Stalin and Mao, Putin and Xi Jinping have made a similar strategic miscalculation of a probably equally profound nature. So Putin believed that the West was not going to come to the defense of Ukraine. He watched what happened after the seizure of Crimea in 2013-14, the battles in the eastern part of Ukraine. Basically, there was an attitude which you could see in Europe, and you could see in the US, that said, well, this is actually a Russian sphere of influence. Uh, we, we don't, this is not an essential interest of ours. European attitudes were very uh, uh, mixed regarding Ukraine. Uh, Germany was deeply engaged with Russia. So Putin made the calculation that no one was going to respond uh, in the West to his attempt to seize the rest of Ukraine. Xi Jinping made a similar miscalculation. He believed that uh, uh, it was he, on February, in, in the midst of the Winter Olympics, for the invasion of Ukraine, he declared this unbounded friendship between China and, uh, and Russia. And he basically saw that the Russian challenge to the West in Europe was actually would undermine the West, undermine Europe, undermine the United States, and would work to the benefit of China as it seeks to expand its own global power. I, I think, again, as we saw in the Korean War, the opposite has happened. The West is more unified than ever has been before. Europe, which had been really wavering on many issues, including dealing with China as a rising power, is now uh, solidified and, and, and expanding, if you will, in ways we haven't seen before. Yeah, there are tensions, there are difficulties, but still, the thrust of the uh, NATO alliance is now quite different than what it was even you know, a year ago. And on the, for the Chinese, two things have happened. One is that, in fact, where the US was really content to leave the status of Taiwan completely ambiguous and not to be, not really be clear about what the American security commitment is to Taiwan as it was before the Korean War broke out. It's now, it's now moved very rapidly in the other direction. Taiwan has now become a central focus of American security policy and of our alliances in the region. So the result is that, and the other thing that it's done is that it, it dragged the Chinese into a losing war. And think about this, that this war could end in a stalemate, sure, like Korea did. It ended in a stalemate, an armistice, which still stands. Um, and it's certain that there will be a negotiated outcome to this war, but I don't think it's likely to be end up in a Korean-style armistice in place. I think it's going to be a clearer outcome. And at this point, you know, I, I believe the, uh, it's, it's heading towards a place where Russia is going to have to admit in some de facto way uh, its defeat. That's an outcome that heavily impacts the perception of the United States as a power, the perception of Europe as a power. And China, which has linked itself to Putin, you know, is sort of faced with the possibility that the perception of Chinese power will also be deeply affected. Uh, sure, we see a situation where there are many countries in the Asia Pacific region that have chosen to remain neutral. India, much of Southeast Asia, uh, even countries like Vietnam. And some people interpret that as, uh, in some ways, uh, a victory for Chinese foreign policy at this point, uh, that uh, uh, other countries in the region are not choosing to take sides in the way that the United States would prefer that they do. But I don't think that that actually is a long-standing condition. In fact, they're neutral while they're waiting for the outcome. And if the outcome is one, where Putin loses and Xi Jinping loses, they're going to draw a different set of conclusions about where the direction of power in the world, where
where the global system was. But I think what we're going to see is a reinvigoration of the post-war, cold, cold war order, if you will, which the people had seen as being uh, under assault and, in fact, you know, losing its potency. I think, in fact, it's going to be, it is being reinvigorated. Not necessarily, it's still a more multipolar world but it's going to be reinvigorated by the results of the war in Ukraine. I think this is a serious challenge to Xi Jinping at a time when he faces really, I think, uh, profound internal challenges, much more profound than we've seen uh, facing the Chinese leadership maybe since the time of the uh, Cultural Revolution. Why? Because the Chinese elite, and I base this on a very anecdotal uh, way on what little contacts I've had, and also what I talk to people who are also talking to Chinese. The Chinese elite is not happy with the direction of policy in China. Yes, Xi Jinping has got tremendous command of the system. He's got unchallenged authority in some ways. But they, I think uh, amongst people I know, the discussion is that he's made terrible mistakes. He's made, and, and this is down to the level of you know, my Chinese students in my class, this is the way they talk. So it's, it's seeping down in a way. Made a mistake aligning himself with the Russians. Made a mistake in crushing the, uh, the large-scale market actors in China, the sort of Jack Ma's uh, retreat. People saw Xi Jinping initially as a reformer who would use an anti-corruption campaign to launch a second phase, if you will, of market in China. Instead, he's proved to be someone who seeks to consolidate the control of the state over the economy. And I think the failures of the, we see slowing growth, of course, but the failures of the zero COVID policy are also really dangerous for Xi Jinping. And because we see now visible resistance to that. And it's not just about forcing people to stay in their apartments. It's also about he went for a kind of decoupled Chinese techno-nationalist approach to uh, pandemic control, refused any cooperation with the mRNA vaccine makers in Europe and the US. And as a result, the Chinese population is less protected than it was before. And, and Chinese know that. And it's, it's, it even came up in the discussions when uh, Chancellor Schmidt, the uh, German chancellor, looked at recently in, uh, in China. So I think we see in the, I looked at the Biden Xi Jinping meeting that took place this week as a really interesting Rorschach test. It's not to be judged from the standpoint that they reached some grand agreement to, you know, uh, on Taiwan or, or anything else, but it, it, I think we saw, you know, I, Biden is a, I think in many ways, the best leader we could have at this moment because he's extremely experienced. I mean, he's been dealing with these people for a long time. He had a long, long relationship with Xi Jinping. He was Senate Foreign Relations Committee chairman. He, has, he brings a lot of experience here. I think the game he's playing is a smart one, which is that, and, and it's not just him, it's people around him. They are probing the Chinese constantly for fissures between themselves and, and the Russians. They see signs of Chinese hedging. They know the Chinese aren't going to abandon the Russians. Xi Jinping can't do that. He's locked into the commitment that he made uh, to Putin. But he is increasingly trying to create some maneuver room for himself. And I think that uh, there, there are other, you know, in some ways, the Chinese are voting with their markets, if you will. Yes, they bought a lot of oil and gas, as have the Indians. But they've done it for the most cynical reasons, because the Russians are forced to sell their oil and gas at discount prices and everybody and anybody who can who's willing to is taking advantage of it. Uh, but they're not providing the investment, the aid, the even the military aid, the things that the Russians really more than anything else need because they're hedging. They're hedging. So I think this allows the US to move more aggressively on regional economic strategies. We see it with the IPAP, the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Maybe we'll see after the election, and I think the election results are also interesting because they reinforce the idea that the United States is not in retreat. I think there's still a great fear, the fear of America, the sort of lingering effect of the Trump era 
of America as an isolation, as growing isolation of power, population that wants to abandon the responsibilities we had. But I think Biden has pushed back on that, and in some ways the election results actually help him a lot. And you can see that in the trip he made after the election, because it, the people who are defeated are the most isolationist parts of the Republican Party. Not the Republican Party as a whole, but those who are uh, actually embrace that kind of, uh, of abandonment of allies and of American security responsibilities. So Taiwan is a dangerous but manageable situation in my view. So I, I don't see, and this is a debate that's going on amongst US specialists, but uh, I don't see Taiwan, a, a war in the Taiwan Straits happening soon. Maybe, maybe who knows when. I think that for the Chinese leadership, they remain, uh, the most priority for them is to maintain the status quo. So they can't afford a drift to independence, uh, and they're constantly trying to figure out whether the United States is, in fact, sotto voce, under the table, encouraging Taiwanese independence while it talks about one China. So I think that was clearly a long discussion that went on between Xi and Biden about this. I don't know whether they convinced each other of anything, but I think that it's a manageable situation if uh, the Chinese are convinced that the U.S. is not trying to change the status quo. I also think that the Chinese are watching the war in Ukraine and learning some things, as are everybody else, which is that it's really difficult to carry out large-scale military warfare uh, in particularly in a situation where uh, advanced technology is beginning to transform the nature of warfare. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But, um, so the Biden approach to allies, I think, has been rather, uh, in some ways, you know, the, the kind of approach we had for decades, but we, it, we, it was undermined during the Trump era. We returned to traditional emphasis on alliance management. And the nature of our relationship with our key allies in the region, and that's Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, is stronger today, I think, than almost any point I can imagine uh, in the past. Uh, partly it's due to the, uh, the way, the, the, the general sense of the threat from China, but it's also due to the alarm, I think, that people share about what the implications of the war in Ukraine are. Because if you accede to a seizure of territory by use of force, you have undermined the entire global system. And everybody understands that. Koreans understand that. Japanese understand that. Other people in the region understand that. So I think that we now see more consolidation of the alliance system, and now we see these sort of mini, mini laterals that are now emerging, the caucus arrangement, uh, the quad, although I think the quad is troubled because of India's neutrality in the war uh, with Ukraine. But still, I think the base of the Americans and I think the Aussies and everybody else has decided that they're going to look the other way to some degree uh, at what India is doing as the long-term benefits of drawing India into this larger regional framework sort of outweigh the short-term problem that they're causing. So I could talk about the Korean-Japan relationship, but I'll, I'll leave that to in case you guys are interested in particular in that. But I think it's very important that Korea and Japan are repairing their relations. And I think that, that, will, that the, the North Koreans, thank you to Kim Jong-un, are providing lots of impetus for our allies to solve their problems, because everybody understands uh, what the threat is. And I, I think the North Koreans have leaked into the arms of the Russians. Uh, they're the only country I know that actually recognized the Russian annexation of the four uh, provinces of Ukraine. And they did that because they're desperate for any kind of help that they can get. So um, one of the, I just finished with this, that I think that uh, one of the, and, and I, I would point out that these are not necessarily all strong governments. Japanese government's facing a lot of internal problems. The South Korean government, tremendous internal problems. 
So in many ways, they're weak governments, but they're stable democracies. And that matters. So the underlying uh, strength of their systems is not in in doubt as much as the, the strength of individual leaders to survive domestic problems. But those have nothing to do with the global events and the regional events that have to do with internal issues. So one of the potential problems, however, in this alliance system is how to deal with technology competition with China. I think the you know supply questions of supply chain uh, resiliency, technological competition, uh, you know, potential disruptions of uh, trade flows. These are, I think, the big issues of the day, really, once we get past the large strategic picture. The, uh, there is no doubt that in China, in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, and in Europe, to some degree, there is a concern that the policies that the Biden administration has embarked on regarding technology uh, security issues, the linkage between technology and security and supply chain issues is uh, sort of techno-nationalism in disguise. That it's American protectionism, it's a sort of a, uh, some ways uh, continuity with the Trump administration's protectionist views. Uh, so the subsidies for uh, semiconductor manufacturer, the battery technology and so on are really just a form, yet another form of kind of industrial policy slash techno national I don't think that's a uh, illegitimate um, criticism, although frankly it's a little ironic coming from countries who practice exactly these policies for many, many decades. Uh, but anyway, leaving that aside, but I think it's actually probably wrong. I mean, there are pieces of that that's absolutely uh, playing to, uh, you know, sort of a uh, compete with China, uh, using China as a way of promoting policy, industrial policies of various kinds, including industry subsidies. But if you look at the specific things that the um, administration recently announced, they're really an implementation of uh, policy that actually I, I wrote about some while ago in, uh, in Wired before the election or at the time of the election. It's what Eric Schmidt loves to call small yards, high fences approach. So Eric Schmidt was the head of the defense, chairman of the Defense Innovation Board, very important. And he, he, rep, he really reflects the views of a group of people in Silicon Valley who are very concerned about the intersection between uh, national security and high technology. And his approach has been, he's not the only one, but he sort of has been the forefront of it is, don't try and block everything. So this is not about selling, you know, middle grade, low grade memory chips, semiconductors for, you know, cell phone handsets to the Chinese. No one's going to stop that. Uh, Samsung will compel all the chips it wants to, Japanese to. That's not the, that's not the target of this policy. The target of this policy is the way high end uh, of the semiconductor business. So that's the uh, semiconductor machinery that can make, you know, mini, you know, two nano uh, uh, chips. That's what's being blocked. And it's being blocked because it has incredible military applications. And also because it represents the front edge of technology development going down the road. I mean, some of a civilian nature. So the problem is that this is not something the US, we, we live in a global world, we know we live in a global world. Nobody believes in decoupling. Chinese don't. Nobody that I know in the U.S. truly thinks so. Because unfortunately, or fortunately, the supply chains and the movement of technology is across border. So then the problem is how do you coordinate these policies with other countries who are allies? Japan, China, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Europe, and so on. We, we have to do that. They've, the administration wanted to come out with a unified policy. They couldn't do it. Uh, they're still trying. To some degree, they want to create a fait accompli and force everybody to fall in, but I think they also would like to, we have the CHIPS 4 uh, discussions, they want to get a broader agreement, and I think they will eventually, it's going to take a little time. But th this is, I think, the most interesting area where you see the U.S. trying to manage, as we go ahead, uh, what 
how the Asia Pacific region is going to look. And I think the Chinese actually, um, they're, they're, they're in deep trouble in this regard. They're not, I don't buy the triumphant Chinese are going to decouple and do their own thing. It's not going to work. So last point, there, there are two uh, big upsides for the Ukraine war that maybe some of you are interested. It's forced, first, it's forced a big change in energy policy. I think that it, it, the, maybe the greatest benefit of this is, is going to be in decarbonization, uh, probably for Europe, but everywhere else. While we, you know, retain carbon-based energy systems for a long time to come, but it, it, it has made that an imperative. And secondly, the defense technology is going to be is being transformed. This is the largest, uh, I, the driver of the big technology development is going to continue to be defense driven, ironically, as it was earlier in the Cold War. AI, quantum uh, computing, highly integrated systems, uh, which, which reward software and engineering expertise. You just have to look at what's going on in the battlefield in Ukraine. You can understand that uh, many, many big lessons are being learned. Who's going to win in that? Who's going to gain from that? <laughs> Not Russia. Not China, but the United States and our allies. So I'm actually relatively optimistic, if you will. So I mean, I, I read the Cold War 2.0. I found that to be hopelessly pessimistic. Anyway, I'll stop there. I thought I'd on too long. Thank you. I'm Colonel Shizu from uh, Japan Air Soft Defense Force. And, uh, I'm now posted, uh, uh, I'm a Chief Director of the Innovation Driving Office for Emerging Technology in ASO. Uh, this, now, this trip is on business trip to uh, visiting Silicon Valley area and uh, other Air Force Base. And uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, so, uh, Three years ago, I was a uh, uh, visiting scholar to Stanford University, and then we talked about uh, international relationship between South uh, East Asia. Then, any comment? Uh, no, no, no. Every teacher or uh, some uh, analyst doesn't doesn't think this situation so Ukraine and uh, Russia issue. Then also, next one is uh, Taiwan. And from here, maybe you cannot uh, distinguish current situation in the south, uh, no, in front of so, uh, Japan and uh, China. So economic and domestic, uh, diplomatic and military, every field is very complicated. And uh, sir, your uh, comment and uh, very impressive in just Directly to me. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, uh, yes, and uh, so, uh, anyway, my current post, post is so for uh, technology for national defense. So it's very important. Also, this thing, this field, uh, your comment, you were uh, thinking just to me. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, if you were. In, in your situation, we're watching uh, a really interesting battlefield test of weapon systems that have not been really tested in combat till now. Uh, the use of drones, mm -hmm. I mean, anyway, uh, unassisted uh, vehicles of all kinds, yes. the air defense systems, sensor systems, guidance systems, uh, the ability to suppress radar, I mean, and uh, the, even the ability to communicate, to maintain communication systems under uh, fairly heavy uh, artillery and air assault, mm -hmm. which we've seen with the mobile internet systems and so on. These are, this is like, uh, I'm sure that in your military, I know in our military, and I suspect elsewhere, 
people are spending. They're up 20 hours a day uh, looking at the data that's coming in from the battlefield. And we are sending systems into combat that have any, like the, the, the German Iris T air defense system, it never hasn't even been fielded yet with the, uh, with the German army. So, uh, they're, and it's a really interesting system. It's able to track incredible number of targets at the same time. If I'm Japan, and I'm thinking about North Korean missile systems, I, I, would, I hope you have a liaison officer, mm -hmm. maybe four or five or 10 of them, sitting in Poland uh, or in Germany at the, uh, at the joint command there and looking, doing some very important examination of the battlefield data that's coming in. So I'm, I'm going to learn a lot. Yeah. If I could also say as well, even with Elon Musk and Starlink and things of that yeah. sort of what are happening, that's also a very, very new situation that, that has, you know, has not happened in the past where you actually have a commercial uh, you know, space network effectively that, that's, sort of, that's involved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the use of dual-use te dual technologies in warfare, which I know has been a discussion at uh, the Japanese uh, uh, people who are doing R&D, defense R&D in Japan, uh, looking for opportunities to use civilian technology for military use, partly for cost-saving reasons. But there's a lot of, I mean, we're seeing you know, commercial drones, silly drones that people used to use to play around with are now used for artillery targeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's transformative, and I, that's why I'm saying, it, it's, I mean, I don't like to talk about warfare in the way that, in any way, lessens the horror of what's going on in the battlefield. But, you know, we're going to be in this world for a long time. So if I'm Taiwan, for example, I think I, I probably am going to rethink a lot of what uh, you're spending money on. Defense. And I think Japanese are going through the same exercise. Yes. Yes. So, one more point, one more yeah. comment. So, uh, sir, you point out that the C2, uh, like uh, communication is very important. So, uh, C2, command and control, is the most important thing so in the military field. Uh, as you know, uh, Ukraine, so uh, you said, so Starlink, mm -hmm. so a civilian satellite use uh, for uh, recognition, for uh, communication and uh, for sending sending something and they're also receiving something uh, use communicate so a civilian satellite so uh, if ukraine has no satellite capability but that capability from so uh, Elon Musk, so present to the russian people so uh, if not so uh, maybe ukraine cannot fight to against russia uh, because c2 Command and control is a very, very important thing. And, uh, and one more thing, so uh, uh, we have to learn two to, uh, issues. Ukraine and the Russian issue, and uh, uh, Nagorno Karabakh issue. You know, sir? Right. Yes. I've actually so, spent a lot of time Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> yes, because both two uh, conflict is uh, teach us a lot. About drones. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. and communicate. Right. So we have to learn. And uh, I love peace. I don't hate. Uh, I hate war. And it's, so I have to, I have to protect my country and the people and uh, everything. So uh, the peace, keep peace is very important. So uh, we have to do something. I'm sorry. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snyder, and um, thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Shizu, yeah, thank and, uh, again, the director of the Japanese Air Force. Um, <coughs> so now we'll move on uh, <coughs> uh, to your introduction as well. Oh, sure. Um, sure, thank you, Amanda. So, um, yeah, so uh, let me just, uh, maybe I could also give a little bit more about my background. So, again, previously I worked for the Stanford Research Institute, SRI International. It's the largest independent research and development, one of the largest in, here in the United States. Um, about 2,000 uh, researchers. Um, a lot of the work uh, that we were doing was with the U.S. federal government agencies, primarily with the Department of Defense, uh, with the DOD. Uh, and uh, under that, there's a group called uh, DARPA, which is the uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, 
and uh, you know, my role was uh, was to really take the technology that was coming from the government projects and then figuring out how we could take that and commercialize that technology. And oftentimes that was being done by working with many overseas partners. Um, you know, one of the questions that came up previously was with regards to uh, you know globalization versus localization. I guess, uh, and um, you know, I. I I'm old enough to remember the days before, um, you know, when, there, when the Soviet Union was around, and then, uh, and then, it, you know, split up, and so and how things had changed with that. But um, I think I, I really want to echo what Dan was saying that it's. I think it's going to be hard to decouple China from the global economy. However, I do believe, though, as well, that there will be these regional alliances that are set up. And then, as uh, you know, say between Japan and the U.S. and things, that those will only get stronger and stronger. Where again, where certain types of technologies obviously will be limited, uh, you know, into into some uh, countries, say uh, such as China and things of that sort. But um, but to say though, I think that we've we've certainly entered into a, a different world, uh, you know, uh, since uh, February of uh, this year, uh, with uh, Russia uh, going into Ukraine and. Um, I think that you know, it will be very, very uh, interesting to see where, where things continue to go as, as, uh, as things progress forward. Um, I guess you know, what I want to do, though, is I think what probably would be a better use of time would be maybe if there were questions that, that you guys might have from the audience that uh, you'd like to ask either myself or Dan, and we could, we could kind of go through that. So we prepared the Q&A sessions, uh, so we can proceed. But if there's any questions so far, you can uh, ask. We can move on to the trends. <laughs> Thank you. So, so yes, we will move on to showcasing what the trends of the radar has shown. And in particular, these five questions related to globalization and, and how it affects uh, and, and its comparisons with localization, the, cold, the first Cold War, uh, driving the cause and effects from the first Cold War, and comparing them to the potentially ongoing Second Cold War tensions, where, uh, as well as the economy or the world, uh, democracy itself, and investments, and innovation, how all of these topics affect our world today, and in particular the Asia Pacific region. So to give a bit, before we go deep into the radar, I would like to uh, provide a context for those not familiar with the radar. You can think of this radar as a sort of search engine. The next the next generation of Google and Crunchbase, or uh, because at the moment many uh, search engines, Google for instance being the most notable, only showcases ten results at a time per page. It is very hard to decipher patterns from that because it is all text and it is very hard to filter what are the most current topics that are actually being suggested. And so what this radar is able to do is to take tens of thousands of these results and form it into one map showcasing not only where the, the areas that are the most discussed but it would also be able to showcase what is around it and the areas of opportunities that have yet to be discussed as well. Um, so there are many niches one can be able to uh, see uh, on a deeper level that otherwise could not be seen with many search engines today. <clears throat> that being said, this is the data set that we used. We collected over 30,000 documents. Um, uh, in the form of news API, um, and uh, and it was basically uh, collected throughout various web sources, with the query words in particular being China, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Asia, Asia Pacific, as well as key topics such as trade, tensions, relations, relationships, and competition. <clears throat> A lot of this data is collected between 2018 to this year, 2022. And over 5,000 clusters or dots that you will see have been formed from here. <clears throat> so what you see right now are 
the highly dense clusters on the right side, uh, as well as the left side. So the right side, as we can see, tends to, um, <clears throat> tends to be more political, whereas the left side of the cluster is more technological. We, uh, what's in between these um, are topics related to cybersecurity and ransomware. And we, uh, which leads us to believe that there is an increasing discussion throughout uh, news sources throughout the world um, regarding these, these types of um, areas. <clears throat> and so, uh, what, we, what we can potentially see here is this sort of like the storm before the calm. <clears throat> and so, as countries continue to uh, be more productive and be the sort of competitive edge in the world and as a result of the pandemic there is this sort of inward trajectory going on where countries are in some ways becoming increasingly less um, reliant or more independent uh, of how they do global trade <clears throat> and so uh, basically there are in an increasing amount of countries including the United States where there is a need to become more self-sufficient in, in various key areas such as technology. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> what we see here uh, as a second area of discussion, um, I noticed, is <coughs> there, um, there is a sort of uh, issues going on um, related to Hong Kong. And as we are able to see a little bit further, we notice that there's this sort of, um, um, when, when uh, just the fact that Hong Kong is an international city, there is this sort of, whenever there is a sort of economic downturn, it's um, going to have a ripple effect throughout the world. Um, and what we see here is basically, I wouldn't say it's the start of the new Cold War, but it's basically, considered to be like the powder's keg that significantly um, um, brought the topic of the Asia Pacific region to the foray of the world spotlight, like in the world spotlight. So, and we wanted to understand where the trajectory of the Cold War would be. Um, and finally, uh, we, Notice that the most common areas of discussion that is being discussed is related to Kim. Uh, in particular, Kim Jong-un um, and their um, but, but volatility in terms of uh, their demeanor uh, seems to be the most common um, points of discussion as, as of recent times. Um, but as far as this data goes, it was showcasing how their uh, the 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 Korean the North Korean government has had this sort of work, vo volatile approach where a few years ago they started becoming um, more peaceful in, in some ways and, and uh, but but in most recent times that is unfortunately no, no longer the case um, but nonetheless the government of North Korea is is now increasingly becoming a hot topic of discussion in the global arena. So that is something I feel would be worth mentioning, and given all these factors, for, for you two as a panelist, uh, what do you think and, and believe are the differences between the first Cold War and this potential, uh, in, potentially increasing tensions um, that, could potent that could lead to the second Cold War that we see today? Well, I don't really like that concept of the you know, new Cold War. I think it's a kind of a newspaper, uh, media, kind of fluffy sort of idea. Um, and I, most serious analysts that I know I think it's way too simplistic an idea. So look, the Cold War, so I'm old enough to have lived through almost the entirety of the Cold War. So, and I spent my life looking at it, and the it, it was, First of all, a profound ideological struggle um, and a contest of systems, if you will. Um, 
but it also was driven by the great power ambitions of states. And certainly that's true for the Soviet Union, and to some degree the United States as well, uh, and China to the extent that it's part of it. I, do, I think that in this case, what we're looking at now, we, look, we went through, um, are we in a ideological competition uh, of systems? Well, maybe to some degree, and the Biden administration has tried to use this framework of autocracies versus democracy. It's not a bad a way to try and define uh, differences, but in fact, it's a pretty, I, I don't know that it's, we're not dealing with, uh, is China promoting a different system uh, as an alternative to the United States and to the major developed capitalist countries? I don't think so. Um, well, China, uh, the, you know, I have lots of Chinese students. I look at their transcripts sometimes, and everybody has to take a class at Chinese universities on uh, studying of uh, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping thought on China, on socialism with Chinese characteristics. I bet you that uh, they're probably all falling asleep in that class. There is no such thing as Xi Jinping thought, uh, and the reality is that uh, the Chinese Communist Party lost control of its ideological raison d'etre in the late 1980s. Communism is, is an empty construct. Socialism, I think, is largely an empty construct uh, in China today. And uh, instead, it's basically the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party is built on two things. Their claim to be the, uh, the embodiment of Chinese patriotism, Chinese nationalism, that they're, uh, you know, uh, restoring China to its rightful status as a great nation, and on delivering economic prosperity and growth to the Chinese people, which is a function mostly of the growth of the of a, of a capitalist market economy within the structure of uh, the Chinese state. And that's not a, you know, there is no China model, I don't think. There's no, uh, uh, system that somehow is attractive to other people. People who are, uh, the Chinese have no allies. Well, they have one treaty ally in the world. You know what it is? North Korea. North Korea. That's it. The most failed state I can imagine. So uh, they may have bought themselves a lot of friends, but they don't actually have any. Uh, I mean, that is the great strength of the American alliance system is that, is that we actually have allies. And allies are often difficult. You, you have to compromise and do things. So I, in that sense, I think Frank Fukuyama, my colleague, was right when he wrote about the end of history at the end of the Cold War. The, the contest of systems is over. It's now a contest of great powers. And it's a contest about uh, uh, claims to uh, desire to seek uh, to you know, hegemony of a regional or a global nature. The one thing I think that's interesting, and Americans have faced for a long time the, uh, the, the dangers of the arrogance of power. We've made, of all the strategic mistakes the United States has made in the post-war period, the Vietnam War, frankly the Iraq War, uh, the, the two that come to mind the most, those are a product of arrogance, the arrogance of great powers. Um, and Chinese are wonderfully reproducing all of the same mistakes uh, that all great powers make. I mean, I watched, uh, that was a little clip today of a, an interaction between Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister. And it was some, you know, uh, Xi Jinping was dressing down Trudeau, was caught on the microphone for leaking out the contents of some of their conversations they had. But what came across to me is, the arrogance, just the facial uh, <laughs> expression of Xi Jinping, the arrogance that was there was so manifest. And I thought, well, that's the way great powers act towards people they think are their inferiors. Uh, and they can't treat the United States that way. But I think Japanese know, for example, that for a long time, Japan and China dealt with each other as equals to a large extent. But at the moment when China had surpassed Japan uh, in, as the second largest economy in the world and GDP, there was sort of a weird psychological moment where uh, Chinese
he started to deal with Japanese in a different way. So arrogance and great powers, that's what I see. Is that Cold War 2.0? I don't know. I think we're still living inside the, the post-war system that we created at the end of the war. It's an amazingly enduring system. If anything, we're reviving it. So I, I tend to reject that, that formulation, although it has pieces of it that I don't know the answer to that. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, um, any competition has like a certain point of winner. Like, the America won the Cold War, or the, the, the Western system won. And we brought a concern here, we talked about ordinary people, is will China surpass America? As an economist, like that says, that that's probably, will, will they have the biggest economy in the world? I don't know, maybe. But, like, there are a lot of imbalances in China and their economy. Uh, a lot of Chinese people might need to share an office with PhD students from China when I was younger. They didn't really have like, concepts of like property prices can go down. Uh, like getting eight percent on an account <laughs> is not normal. Uh, do you think there are any like inherent risks that China would A I could do you think America will come out on top, or do you think it's going to be China that comes out on top in this competition? And be like, work. what's going to happen to the Chinese system if they have, say, a big financial downturn? Well, I, I think the, the fragility of the Chinese system is something that I think about a lot. I'm not in the uh, China is 100,000 feet tall uh, and is going to grow inexorably and take over the world. It's nonsense. No one who's looking at the actual internal dynamics of the Chinese economy, I think, seriously believes that. There's still immense poverty in China. They're caught in a middle-income trap uh, because they've got an aging society uh, which doesn't have, uh, hasn't produced enough wealth for them to be able to pay for. Uh, look, Japanese have the oldest, uh, highest population over 65 in the world, but they also have accumulated massive savings and wealth which allow them to uh, deal with the problem of aging. Chinese don't have that. Uh, and they're aging before they got rich, rich enough. That's number one. They're obviously engaged in, uh, you know, the, one, of the, one of the interesting things is the interplay between the Chinese state-run economy, so the lingering sort of institutions of the state-run economy, which are linked together with the system of political power, Chinese Communist Party leadership, uh, and the market. And you've got wonderful entrepreneurial activity in China. I think it's driven the Chinese growth to a large extent. But clearly, the Chinese state feels threatened by actors who are able to have power outside of the structure of the state. I think the, the kneecapping of Jack Ma was a really interesting moment to me. Um, and I think that the, uh, the, they're undercutting the dyna most dynamic part of the Chinese economy. Um, and it's a, it's a risk-taking part of the economy. I think Chinese, uh, one thing about Chinese business, as far as I can see, is that they're, they're, they're risk-takers, more so than Japanese businesses or maybe even Korean businesses. They, they have a kind of a, a, that piece of entrepreneurship, maybe not other parts, like you know, responsible uh, contract management and things like that. But so I think they've got these huge problems. They've got speculative, they've got speculative bubbles all over the place. They're trying to drive down property prices now in a slow way, but they've got huge debt overhang built into all, all levels of government in China. So, I mean, I think they, they're, and they know that. I mean, Chinese economists and Chinese policymakers are well aware of all these things. Growth is already slowing down. It's natural that it does. I mean, it, this is the same pattern you've seen Elsewhere, and all the Asian tigers went through the same pattern. And I think the interesting thing is that the, 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 this idea of, so the Chinese, the initial phases of Chinese growth were driven by China as an export platform, uh, sort of OEM model, um, more so than Japan. So Japan, you know, restricted FDI to a certain extent and uh, licensed technology, but didn't, allow, you know, a lot of foreign ownership within the Japanese economy for, you know, really up till fairly recently in some sense. Chinese, no, they opened up, they, they allowed a lot of foreign ownership, they drove the, the export economy that way, 
But then when they hit a certain point, the Chinese, which is not unusual, said, okay, we want to go up the value chain. We don't want to be, you know, assembling uh, uh, iPhones. We want to make our own stuff. But they're hitting, they're hitting real uh, problems in carrying that out. Their problem, and the basic problem that I see, and I don't mean to demean, I mean, individual Chinese. I mean, look, Chinese in Silicon Valley are really important players. But it's hard to, technological innovation, I think, requires open societies. It requires individual freedom, and it requires uh, a flow, the ability to flow information across all sorts of barriers. You, it's very difficult to accomplish individual innovation, innovation without individual freedom. And I frankly, I think the Japanese faced that problem as well in the late 80s. I remember I was living in Japan at the time, and Japanese were, you know, there was a lot of talk about how Japan was going to take over the world, and Japanese, you know, the Japanese model, and uh, uh, MIDI was going to pick all the winners, and everything was going to be great. And you know, how do you foster individual creativity under the aegis of a state-directed system? It failed in Japan. That's why Japan lost the, they lost out on the whole 90s IT boom because there wasn't an atmosphere for, for really allowing individuals uh, to operate more freely outside the realm of the state. I think the Chinese have the same problem. Worse, worse. So, you know, great. Chinese want to decouple their economy from the rest of the world. If I if I were uh, an enemy of China, I would say, go for it. Good idea. Why don't you do that? It it, it will produce the collapse of, of China as an economy and as a society. And I think Chinese leadership understands this pretty well. So I don't I don't buy the rhetoric really about decoupling. But it, it's a response to some degree to the restrictions that are being imposed from the outside. Let's make a virtue out of that. So I think what, and I think that's true for the United States as well. We, we live in a global economy. I don't care what Donald Trump and his supporters say. Anybody who lives in Silicon Valley knows there is no, there's no such thing as a decoupled uh, United States. We live in a global economy. It's the globalized sector of our economy, of all economies, that drives growth and change. And we need, therefore, to have a cooperative relationship with China. I think it's essential. And it, it just, it, it, to me, that's why I don't buy Cold War 2.0. What's that? I mean, we're going to end up in a, in a, a military confrontation with China? But it's a path to mutual destruction, as far as I'm concerned. So I think that I'm just waiting for, I think the big problem uh, that happened in China in both places. Ironically, the United States went down an isolationist path with a, frankly, a, a, a neo-fascist uh, person who ended up in the presidency of the United States. I'm sorry I have to say these things, but I mean, it's certainly a would-be authoritarian. I mean, he'd love to have the power of uh, Putin or Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping went down this path as well. And it was a mistake for both. I think we, I hope we've corrected that mistake in the United States. We'll find out in the next two years from now. But Chinese are going to have to correct that mistake. And I don't know how they're going to do it because their system is not flexible enough to allow that. Russians, I also, by the way, I'm a deep Russophile. I love Russia. My, my son married to a Russian. He was a correspondent for the Economist in, in Russia for eight years. I, I spent a lot of time in Russia. I believe that Russia will return to Europe, which is where it belongs. And there's, there's great potential for, for uh, Russia to play a fabulous role in the world. But I, I think that we're in a difficult moment, but I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's far away, but I see. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah. yeah. Well, we hope we see that light soon. <laughs> I didn't say soon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have much more to add from Dan, but, but just say from my own personal perspective, um, you know, again, if, and I as well, I'm not sure if I agree with this whole statement of Cold War 1.0 versus 2.0, but to say, of course, uh, 
uh, you know, historically it was very much around ideology, as, as Dan was saying. And the thing for me, though, is I, I think that you know, historically it was a very, um, you know, very clear cut in terms of you, on the one side you had NATO and, you know, with the United States, and on the other side you had, say, Russia and the Warsaw Pact, and, and now things are just seem to be a little bit more open-ended, I think, in terms of in terms of things that are going on. Um, and I, I don't know what your perspective would be, Dan, but I think also this issue of, of weaponizing natural resources of what's going on right now with oil and things like that, I don't know, I guess that was always done, but, but maybe it's a little bit more now. Uh, but I think part of that is obviously due to globalization of what's happened over the years where, you know, say many of the countries in Western Europe became much more dependent on foreign Russian oil and things like that. So it would be also good to get your perspective on that. We live in a, we still live in a fossil fuel country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, and, and states that control large deposits of fossil fuels are going to take advantage of that. And that includes by the way the United States. I mean, we're the world's largest producer oil and gas in the world. We're a net exporter. So, you know, but I, I really, uh, it's interesting to watch Europe right now because Europeans, you know, know they, they're forced to restructure their sources of energy. I mean, the Russians have really made a huge mistake because by using oil and gas as a weapon, the way you describe, they compel Europe to confront that reality and now to try and escape it. The Germans obviously are the ones who are at the center of this, but not only Germany. So I think uh, it'll be, in, this is the challenge of the next year. And I think out of that is gonna come new technology because we've seen solar and wind obviously are beginning to replace fossil fuels, but there are other things coming down the line. I mean, things in the realm of nuclear energy and fusion, uh, fusion and fission, so you know, Somewhere, somewhere down the road, someone's going to be left sitting on a big pile of oil and gas and they can't sell that anymore. Sean, he's working for Aramco's Central Care Arm. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yes, do you have any comments on this discussion about energy? Well, the little bit of commentary. I think um, I mean, solar wind is a good source of energy and good scale batteries haven't really come to light yet, but. Nuclear definitely will fill the gap for the time being, especially with oil and gas being recognized. So, I, I know uh, Germany is the country who's supposed to be commissioning their reactors, and they were going to do so for political reasons, and then right. because of this, <laughs> that's all stopped and gone the other way. So, it's interesting to see how these energy policies are reacting to the, the war in Ukraine and other macro pressures, and uh, see how that plays out in a couple of years. Japanese are doing the same thing, I and mean, they have to roll back the energy. Korea, oh, U.S. Syria as well. And I'm looking at small modular reactors. Right. A lot of projects there. Okay, well, we do have about 20 minutes uh, to, go, to go through four more questions. So, um, I guess we will continue on um, for the next question for a little bit. And for, uh, for, I guess you can comment. Um, and um, basically, as we discussed a little bit earlier, it's related to many countries are becoming increasingly more isolationist in some respects, but at the same, in, in, in an effort to become more self-reliant at the same time. And so there is this, given all these political, given the political climate going on throughout the world, and especially the, the Asia-Pacific region, and the fact that we live in a, in a very globalized economy, uh, is there such a thing as being too dependent? And so the question remains, is globalization going to continue as a result? Well, would you like that? Again, my, my personal opinion would be is that there is no stopping the train of globalization. Um, I, uh, you know, just, uh, the world is too interconnected around that. However, from a deep technology standpoint, uh, sure, I think that there will be certain areas that are going to become more, um, you know, protectionist. And again, you know, Dan had kind of highlighted some of this, uh, some of the stuff in his uh, presentation, you know, with regards to advanced technology around semiconductors or cybersecurity or quantum computing, 
I think that that, that will simply, uh, now there's always been restrictions, right? There's always, always been restrictions, uh, say, for deep technology coming out of the United States, but, but that will probably get uh, even more, I think, in the future. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I think this is a really, as I said, this is a, it's an area of policy that interests me a lot. And I don't know where things are going, and I don't frankly understand all of it, but I do understand that uh, the point is not to make sweeping restrictions on the flow of technology uh, that I think people understand that that's not possible. There's, I mean, you're going to undermine, what's the point of undermining the Taiwanese economy and the Korean economy and the Japanese economy by trying to force them to basically cut the flow of uh, semiconductor sales and semi even semiconductor equipment sales of certain kinds. I mean, it's it's a it's an impossible idea. If anything, all we'll do is we will uh, drive our allies away from us. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that, and I don't think the people who are really engaged in making policy in this administration, I don't refer to the previous administration, I don't think that's what they're trying to do. They they understand that. Um, but as I said, this is this idea of you know uh, small yards, high fences, pick a few key areas that really are essential. I mean, we don't want to be in a situation where we're watching, and I saw some reports on this today, Chinese weapon systems uh, that are built on our technology and potentially used mm -hmm. in a conflict with us. That, that's an unacceptable situation, particularly when we have, you know, five, ten, even longer year leads in these areas. So we want to protect that kind of technology. But we also want to pour resources into, I want to go back to some, some sense, this is the Cold War 1.0, 2.0. One of the features of Cold War 1.0 was we spent a lot of money on basic R&D. This valley is built on defense technology investment in the Cold War. And we need to go back to what people I think are trying to do is go back to funneling you know, in a strategic way, more money to basic R&D and into uh, some kinds of subsidization. I think that the issue of locating fabs, fab, uh, plants in the U.S. is a tricky one. Uh, Koreans talk about friend shoring. Uh, it's a new term, you know, friend shoring rather than onshoring, um, because practically speaking, moving to a lot of production capital capacity back to the United States is actually probably not practical. Um, I, I remember I read an interview some months ago with the head of TSMC, um, the Taiwanese semiconductor, who uh, they're supposedly building a big fab in Arizona. And he was complaining that he can't find enough engineers, uh, can't find the labor force, the, the construction process is too slow. So, uh, you know, actually implementing these things is difficult. I mean, it, 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 I think so, therefore, you have to think about extended supply chains uh, that are protected across national boundaries, not just within national boundaries. And that's a, uh, again, come back to you have to then come to agreements with your allies about how that actually. How does that work? I mean, we faced this in the uh, early days of the pandemic when we had all of these supply shortages, and all of a sudden people are competing for limited uh, supplies of, of resources. And guess what? People do things for their own country. And you know, you, you've got to be careful not to, uh, in some sense, trigger nationalism that can come back and get us in the Not Not easy, it's not a difficult policy. Well, you know, I also wanted to share just a first, kind of pivoting a little bit, but sharing a personal experience and then getting your experience at Stanford University, Dan, is, you know, when I, uh, at the SRI, we would have people come, if I go back enough years, we would literally have people from Russian universities, government, coming to SRI, visiting all the time. We were sharing knowledge, we were educating each other. Similar fashion, I, I, we would literally have a group from China, I think, every day of the week that stopped. Right, very much so. And I don't know if, if you've had the same experience. And that, that, I do think, is kind of going back to this 
about globalization or globalization, let's say, of how knowledge uh, happens? I think there are two pieces to that. One is the sort of xenophobic problem of mm -hmm. which we got from the Trump administration that we're just going to stop the flow. We don't want Chinese students coming to the United States because all they're doing is you know stealing our stuff and whatever. Uh, that's stupid, and people know that are in universities because, after all, you know, across the country there are a lot of universities who have been living off of the flow of Chinese uh, students who pay full tuition and American students don't pay anymore. Um, but uh, so I, the people in the Biden administration who are, if you look at their policy documents, they reject that. And uh, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, and others, they may repeat the statement saying, no, no, we welcome Chinese students. Uh, uh, we want them to come here, and frankly, I mean, I look at my students, a lot of Chinese students in my classes, they're wonderful, they're smart, they're engaged, and frankly, they're critical thinkers about their own government, um, and uh, that's good for us. That's good for us. We want Chinese to be able to come here and get educated and learn how to think and go back and change China. Great. That's good. The, the, there's a narrower problem of protecting, uh, particularly protecting areas of, of research that are defense related. And that's a more tricky problem. Japanese have also been trying to deal with this problem. Uh, you know, so how do you deal with Chinese researchers who are in working in areas that are sensitive areas? There, I think, you know, there are legitimate national security concerns and their issues of not just piracy per se, but espionage. Mm -hmm. And those are serious problems. Thank you. So, so I, as, as we continue to, to um, think about globalization and localization in general, I would like to quickly mention that there is an ongoing dilemma going on in Shanghai at the moment, where many increasingly foreigners and businesses alike are not being able to handle the sort of extreme COVID restrictions that are still in place two years later. <clears throat> and so because of the economic driving force that is China, um, uh, being especially known for its cheap labor and resources, but because of the pandemic, it's becoming significantly more expensive to do business there. That is, um, <clears throat> and so as countries continue to struggle internally, Politicians and the people of the countries alike are starting to move away towards globalization, and from globalization towards localization as well. That I um, actually, I think I'm disagreeing with you. I think the main response is not localization; it's diversification. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you know the apples of this world are not planning on moving iPhone assembly operations back to the U.S. They're just going to move them from China. Uh, some degree to Vietnam, to India, which is what they're doing. I mean, th th that's not globalization, as I said. It's diversification, and everybody's doing it. By the way, Chinese are doing it too, because you know the Chinese companies face rising wages. They 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 move their production elsewhere as well. So I, I mean, India is the big interesting question mm -hmm. in all of this. I mean, huge labor force. Uh, you know. Potentially could take up a huge amount of slack in terms of manufacturing, but it faces some real serious problems. And, you know, that's been there for a long time: infrastructure, bureaucracy, climate. I mean, there are a number. But I, I think I'm watching the uh, way Apple is managing their supply chains. They're very that that company is uh, smarter than any government in, in, uh, in the world as far as these goes. And, and watch where they're going. Well, let's be proud that they're headquartered and founded here in Silicon Valley. So they got their brains from somewhere. <laughs> um, so, so moving on, uh, before we get into our next question quickly, um, there is this sort of increasing volatility um, as far as investors are rethinking um, uh, bonds across Asia. And uh, more, a little bit more into the fact that um, a lot of investors are moving <coughs> towards, yeah, ironically too, to safer markets such as China and away from places like Indonesia and India. 
Now, I, I do want uh, to quickly ask, like, what, how, maybe not the second Cold War, but rather, given the, all these tensions and the pandemic that is going on throughout the world, how is this also, like, affecting the supply chain? Um, especially given that much of the manufacturing of goods has, has been um, from the Asia Pacific region. Well, as I said, I think what we're seeing is diversification. Everybody's doing it. Foxconn's doing it. I mean, Foxconn is p building plants in India. I mean, that's really interesting. Foxconn, which is sort of the emblem of, you know, supply chain uh, yeah. <laughs> movement, you know, creating large supply chains in China, they're diversifying. So, I mean, the, 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 these things can, I mean, there are issues of labor force, there are issues of, you know, cost of production, all these things that actually don't have anything to do with Cold War 2.0 or 1.0. There are issues of the marketplace that have to be solved. But I do think that we've learned lessons about supply chain vulnerability. I would point out, we've learned these lessons before. I mean, look at what happened after the Tohoku earthquake, mm -hmm. the great earthquake in Japan. It's very interesting because Japanese companies who occupy really important middle roles in the in uh, technology supply chains for products like the iPhone or whatever to make the you know the, 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 the screen technology and so on. Turned out you know so it was like one plant located in you know Iwate or someplace like that, I forget where it was, or uh, that had a huge share of that one particular technology without which you couldn't do all sorts of other things. Well so you know that this issue of vulnerability Supply chain. It isn't just vulnerability to the you know the disruptions of war. It's vulnerability to the disruptions of uh, pandemics, uh, natural disasters, all sorts of things. So look, we went headlong down the road, or we companies, multinational companies, of cost reduction, just in time. You know, finding ways to uh, drive the 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 about uh, the cost of production down and create global efficiencies was great. I mean, it created a global consumer market that we all benefited from, but it had, as we've learned, some risks associated with it, and we're going to feel we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, I just think from my side, of, uh, as stated, you know, diversification, I think, is the key one. Um, you know, I think we are, we are going to see more, um, you know, supply chains might change. You know, I think people sometimes get confused. We'll, we'll probably see somewhat more manufacturing here in the States just due to increased automation and things of that sort. Or we might find that there are going to be certain types of technologies that may not be, um, you know, like we said, semiconductors coming out of Taiwan and things of that sort might, might be impacted. But in general, um, we're in a global uh, society and, and I don't think that, you know, we'll diversify, but I don't think a lot of things will change. Thank you. So, so we'll move on um, to the next question, and in particular, this may be relevant for, the, for all the venture capitalists who are here today, um, especially given the fact that the, um, ch ch the, the government uh, and businesses alike are, are kind of um, like reporting increasingly that uh, shouldn't, like, that Shenzhen is becoming the sort of next Silicon Valley. Um, and ironically, at the same time, but like, because of the, of the lockdowns given uh, in China, it's already threatening uh, a significant portion of, our, of the world economy. And so the question remains, uh, what restrictions do you think have been added and, and how, uh, like, what are you view? Are your views on? Um, you talking about restrictions, COVID-related restrictions? Yes, yes, COVID-related restrictions. Uh, it could be within China. It could be from Japan. Um, given all these frictions. Well, I'm not an epidemiologist or a public health specialist, but just watching, you know, I, I uh, <laughs> the greatest impact for me has been I couldn't travel to Japan in the last three years. I, I finally am yeah. going next month, so I'm, I'm overjoyed that the, Japan has opened its borders. Um, look, I mean, I, you know, the, the, there is no 
way to underestimate the impact of the COVID pandemic on the world. Uh, it reshaped politics in any country. I mean, uh, the kind of isolationist, uh, xenophobic movements that we see in the United States, in Europe, elsewhere, uh, are driven by, heavily by, the impact of the pandemic. Um, you know, it, it, and where the economic impacts, of course, of, we've seen it. I mean, we're pulling ourselves out of a, a real global crisis, and we're not out of it yet. And I think the fear that many people have is that, you know, we're just we're, we're just waiting for the next, you know, virus to, to emerge that we're going to have to adjust to. I don't really understand what's going on in that viral sense. However, in my role as the eternal optimist, I'd say the other effect of this, though, has been the um, incredible revolution in biotechnology. I mean, I, I think the uh, I think the the uh, development of mRNA-based biotech is we have just begun to see what the impact of that is. Uh, the ability of these firms to manufacture uh, vaccines in rapid fashion. It used to take five, ten years to have a vaccine to do it in a matter of months. It's amazing. So, you know, crisis has driven innovation. And I think the Chinese problem is uh, twofold. One is, you know, their anti uh, viral, their, their COVID policy is a function of their political system. And the degree to which the regime depends upon tight political and social control, and uh, everything they do, from the you know monitoring of people and the apps that they're forced to do, and the uh, root, these sort of overwhelming responses, of shutting all the whole, whole cities over and so on, it reflects to me a very weak regime, a regime that can't actually. I mean, I'd like to contrast that to Japan. Japan has not done anything like what the Chinese have done. That there are no rules that require people to do anything. There's no laws. No, I mean, it's done through social convention and through leadership um, and through you know proper social hygiene, if you will, public health practices that have been frankly part of Japanese life for since the days of the great flu epidemic of the uh, you know. Century ago, uh, and look at their death rate. It's one of the lowest in the world. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that by locking everybody up uh, in their apartment. A Chinese policy is a failed policy, I think, in many ways. But I think the other reason is that, they, as I said before, they went for a China only uh, vaccine development approach. And in the beginning, they thought, wow, isn't this great? We're like, we're going we're gonna to practice. Chinese vaccine diplomacy, and we're going to develop these uh, vaccines which are based on an older technology. And this is the previous uh, way of developing vaccines, and and now we're going to distribute them all around the world. Well, I I, I think Chinese themselves, they uh, they're not particularly happy about that. Their vaccine efficiency, and I haven't seen the data later, but even I mean even if it's seventy percent, that's probably high. Uh, is look at compared to 90, 95 percent efficiency for for the mRNA technology. I don't know why the German uh, chancellor offered uh, BioNTech, the German firm, offered to you know do co-production, you know transfer technology. China is too proud. I don't know to to admit that they made a mistake, uh, but Chinese people are suffering for that. Yeah, the only thing I have to add is that um, uh, you know here in the U.S., of course, the way COVID was handled, you know, previously was uh, probably was absolutely not the best way to handle it. And there were lot, lots of mistakes that were made. I think saying it politely, um, but now what we're seeing in China is also equally, um, you know, a, 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 you know, being created as a, as a difficult situation. And of course, as Dan is saying, a lot of it is really just being driven by it seems politics and things of that sort and, and pride. But um, yeah. 
So thank you. So, so, we didn't have it. so, so now we'll move on to our last question. Okay. Okay. So we're we're gonna open up uh, the questions. Um, I guess I, I might as well showcase like the last question, um, which is the military industrial complex in a global sense, how that's changing with technological innovation. But I would like to open up the uh, to the audience if anyone would like to have any other questions uh, from from anything else that have transcended in your mind. Um, this past hour or so. So, and, but as far as like, like quickly answering. I, I would like to hear what uh, other people, what people here think about all this. I mean, be useful for me. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? The presenting uh, Japanese company. <laughs> Any questions yeah. or it's a little bit difficult question for us, especially for Japanese. Uh, Japanese people doesn't uh, want to talk about uh, like uh, like commentary things, so. Well, forget that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other ones we've been talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other okay. Okay, yeah. So um, regarding your our presentation, um, I'm just thinking about what the country or nation is, you know. We have a, a two big uh, region in the, in the, in, during the Cold War, West side and East side, and then um, we're uh, struggling with each other, like our ideologically or economically. But now, our it's kind of a sort uh, program because of just like you have presented before. So uh, the next next thing, uh, next thing, it probably it will happen, what the question, uh, what the country or nation means. That's kind of a, a very, very uh, basic question in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. I mean, I don't, I, I think, uh, this is my personal view, but, um, there were a lot of people in the sort of heyday of globalization, mm -hmm. you know, post Cold War, the idea that, well, you know, the nation state is passe, the nation state is gone, we've moved to a kind of, you know, transnational reality. And I think to some degree, this, the relative success of Europe uh, in creating a, uh, the EU and creating a European identity that seemed to uh, supplant national identities uh, created some sense of optimism about that. I think that was unjustified. Uh, we see even in Europe, uh, look at Brexit, but not just Brexit. I mean, I look at the way France and Germany and Poland and all sorts of countries. I mean, national identity remains a powerful force. Uh, I teach about this in, at Stanford. Uh, you know, people's sense of self really doesn't extend much beyond the nation state. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are global values and that kind of thing, but I think identity, uh, there's only a handful of people who would say I'm a citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, 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 so I think the idea that we can get past nationalism, I, I, and that is wrong, but I also think nationalism is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a, a powerful, a good thing. I think the issue we have now in the world is to create structures, multi, look, we, after the end of the Cold War, end of World War II, we created a global system out of defeat and out of conquering depression. We created the you know, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, we created multilateral institutions which tried to, uh, didn't eliminate the nation, but tried to create forms of multilateralism to solve problems. Uh, those institutions are, are in deep need of renewal uh, or maybe replacement. Uh, we have to find struct multilateral structures that are a little more uh, effective. And I think that's in some ways the answer to the, what do we do with this rivalry between the United States and China? Chinese rightfully want a larger place in the global system. That's one of their constant complaints. They don't want to be uh, in a system dominated by the United States, even Russians articulated that way, and that's understandable. And I don't think the United States is any longer in a position to dominate in the way that it was before either. So we need to create truly multilateral institutions, and those require 
powers to in some sense cede some of their authority to larger institutions. It's always a difficult thing. I mean, uh, you know, even in NATO, uh, I can tell you that American military, uh, American military doesn't like to fight under the command of anybody else. So we like to have multilateral allies, collective security agreements, but we tend to want to make the decisions ourselves. That's true for everybody. So I think it's a it's a it's a tricky thing to cede the uh, authority of the nation to somebody else. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't see nationalism going away either. Just looking at uh, Ukraine over some right? it's really that that's uh, you know, the whole underlying premise. So, it's a great great question. Thank you. <coughs> Does anyone else have any questions or comments before? Thank you. What about you? Representing Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Yeah. Uh, no, what's been flying through my head during this talk is I, I've been going on tangents and thinking about things I've heard relating to China. And I just, I was curious about China buying up a lot of ports uh, around the world. Yeah. And how. And this was a, an event that happened before COVID, and how that has been affected during the recent years. Well, I've seen those maps of Chinese investments in ports. I think they're, my sense is they're mainly investments. Um, I mean, Chinese companies have capital, you know, miles of capital, and they're looking at the state. The Chinese economy can't absorb. That's why you get speculative bubbles, because they can't absorb them. That capital. I mean, I think the, the uh, uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, I know in some sense it's seen as kind of a sinister uh, geopolitical expansion of Chinese influence, and the port thing is often put in that way as well. But I think a lot of it was find a place to put Chinese money so that you know Chinese companies can get contracts pour cement in somebody else's country because they've already poured enough cement in, in China that there's no place else to put it. I mean, they got built it. They're building vast apartment complexes that are sitting empty because nobody is there to buy them. I think a lot of it is that. Uh, but some of it may be strategic. I mean, you know, something like Guadour in uh, Pakistan that has some military strategic value, Sri Lanka, that kind of thing. But um, I, 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 I think the Chinese infrastructure boom is dying hmm. uh, right now because they made a lot of bad investments hmm. and they can't recoup them. So sorry to interrupt. So this is easy to so yeah. sorry. <laughs> I have to read. Okay. So, well, I think we, we can end this. Great. Okay, so so we're about to end anyway. But can we all take a lasting picture? Okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So so now, um, any last comments? No. Uh, we're only uh, uh, just for your last question, the last question that was presented. Um, you know, China has been built on being an export economy. Um, I think that it's the second largest power, in, you know, economically right now. Globally, they have, a, as stated, they have a lot and you know, a lot of cash, and they're going to figure out places where to put it. I think part of it is probably strategic in what they're trying to do. Uh, they have uh, the Chinese have big ambitions uh, going forward, but um, yeah, that's uh, kind of my perspective on that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Both of you. Thank you for those who, who were able to visit us online as well. Um, we are now going to continue with our networking um, here in person and open there. So thank you for, for those attending online. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Record. Okay. So, so, yeah. so we'll have